now we're moving on to this second image. Can you start to unpack this a little bit? And I want us to describe for the next few images, basically just the parts of the neuron that we look at in the brain when you're studying plasticity. So what are we actually seeing here? So this is a section of the mouse's brain. Uh, this is called like a coronal section, which is a, it's a particular angle of the cut of the brain. So what we do here is we sacrifice the animal, we take the brain out, and then we uh, put it in fixative. Um, and then afterward, we can now we bring it to a fluorescent microscope to image it. And this is not a normal mouse. This is a transgenic mouse. So this mouse uh, is uh, engineered to have a fluorescent protein already expressing in some of its brain cells. So that's what you are seeing in green. Uh, you can see uh, here, this is uh, the frontal cortex of the mouse, uh, which is where we do most of our studies. And what you can see is you can see the small green circles and those green circles are the cell bodies. Uh, and you can see uh, also lines coming out of the circles and sometimes the lines don't connect to the circle. But those, 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 those lines, those fairly straight lines that radiate out from the circles, those are the dendrites of the cell body. So that's exactly where the, some of the synaptic input would come in for the neurons. I see. So we're literally, for those listening, we're looking at a still image and you can see these bright spots and these bright lines on the image. And it, it looks like the glow in the dark color almost. And that's coming from these neurons in this mouse brain that have been specifically engineered to fluoresce, to emit light so that they can literally see them. So you see these blobs in a certain part of this section. Those are the cell bodies of the neurons. And these lines are the branches, the dendrites you were talking about, Alex. And those you said that they're sort of reaching up and they're probably listening or connected to thousands of other neurons. That's correct. Yeah. And I mean, and also another thing to notice is this, this mouse line, it only labels a specific kind of brain cell. So those brain cells that are laying deeper in the uh, frontal cortex of the animal or in the cortex of the animal. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why you, you see this kind of beautiful organization, again, of these deep laying cell bodies that with dendrites that radiate upwards onto the uh, more superficial areas of the brain. Yeah, and for those listening, these images are they're actually very pleasant to look at. If you had no idea what you were looking at, you might just think it was an interesting photograph or, or piece of art, um, but it's actually the brain of a mouse, which is pretty cool. So this is a still a fairly zoomed out image compared to some of the experiments you do. And this is also a slice from a mouse that is no longer living. But of course, you have this remarkable ability to use two photon microscopes to actually look inside the brain of a living mouse. And I believe we have a short video of what that starts to look like. So I'm gonna play this a few times and can you just describe what we're seeing here? Yeah, so uh, you know, just like what you said, Nick, this is the um, now going to a live mouse. Uh, so when we do these imaging actually for this mouse, the mouse is anesthetized, um, but uh, it has this glass window on its head and we're using the this two photon laser scanning microscope to now uh, imaging these same, uh, you know, fluorescently labeled neurons, um, but now in the live mouse. So what you're seeing in this video is that uh, we're taking an image, uh, and then uh, we uh, and then we take another image that's a little bit deeper, about two micron deeper, and then you go another a, a segment deeper, and then you go another deeper. So this movie basically shows you as you go into the brain how that dendritic branching changes. Uh, and you can see the organization of that, that those kind of dendritic branches. Uh, I mean, one of the things you note is that, you know, we're still kind of on the top of the brain, right? So this imaging is done from the surface. That's why you don't actually see the cell body. What you see is just the, the dendrite that come out of the cell body. The cell body is too deep to see here. Hmm. Yeah, so, so this is also a remarkable image. We're looking at, it's pretty much a black and white image, but the light spots are the insides of these branches of the neurons called dendrites that are lit up. And, and they really do almost look like tree branches or something. Can you comment on some of the finer morphology here? So what I'm seeing is I'm seeing a series of line segments. Those are the dendrites, but it looks like each of these dendrites has a bunch of little bumps or blobs sticking off of it. So what are we actually seeing there? Right. So as I mentioned, a dendrite uh, probably contact thousands of other neurons. So those little uh, knob uh, coming out of the dendrites are what's known as the dendritic spines. Uh, so dendritic spines, most of those dendritic spines are the site of connections. 
uh, for this neuron. Uh, most of them, uh, the majority of them would contain an excitatory uh, synapse, which means that uh, another neuron uh, make a connection there and has a possibility of uh, exciting and depolarizing this neuron. Uh, some of those dendritic spines might also be immature dendritic spines. So they have the shape and may become a mature, dendritic, a mature connection, uh, but they're not yet a functional connection. Um, but this is a, a kind of structurally how one could see uh, the, again, the connectivity of these neurons and what may be the sites of the connections. Hmm. So how do you guys look at dendrites and spines and use that as a way to quantify plasticity? Yeah, again, because these dendritic spines signifies uh, uh, the, connect, the, the possible sites of the connection, we uh, in the lab would measure the density of these uh, dendritic spines. So how many of them are present uh, for each of the dendritic branches we see, uh, which would then indicate the number of connections. Uh, the other thing that we would measure from these dendritic spines is we would also measure the size of them, which would be uh, the diameter of, the, uh, of these little knobs, uh, because it's also been uh, shown and it's quite well known that the size of these dendritic spines uh, relate to the strength of that connections. Uh, and so uh, if you have a larger head, then that signify, typically signifies a stronger uh, connection between these pairs of neurons. And if you have a smaller spine, then it, it's, it's a less mature uh, connection and it's probably a weaker connection. Interesting. So you can literally point the microscope inside of the brain of a mouse. You can make the neurons light up so that you can literally see them. And then you can go in and, and basically take images and movies that allow you to literally count the number of connections or potential connections between one neuron and other neurons. That's correct, yeah. And one thing I should note is that one of the, uh, the power of this technique is, uh, you know, with the glass window, the mouse can carry that around for a long time. So one good thing about this is you can go back day after day, and we indeed do that in the lab, and then go and find that same dendritic branch and the same set of dendritic spines, and then track them over time and see how the number and the size changes, and uh, which is basically how we can characterize plasticity and changes over time. I see. So I think we have one more image here, and it is this one. So we've zoomed in even further now, and I believe this is an image that looks at plasticity before and after psilocybin administration. So can you uh, describe for people what we're actually seeing here? Yeah, so in the lab, we would basically the, um, uh, take the movie that you just saw, um, but maybe typically in a more magnified view so you can see the individual dendrite and dendritic spines more clearly. And then uh, what we would do is compare that movie uh, from day to day. And this is now basically, instead of showing movie, I'm showing you a projection. So um, compressing that movie into a single image and then uh, compare it day by day. Uh, so this... Uh, figure here basically illustrate our main finding, which is uh, comparing imaging these dendrite and dendritic spine before administering psilocybin the day before, and then we image it again the day after, um, and then also the subsequent day. And here we show you uh, day five as well as day 34, so about a month later. And what you can see is we can pretty reliably go back to that same dendritic segment and look for those same putative neuronal, neuronal connections. And what's interesting you see is that uh, you know, some of the spines and most of those connections are pretty stable. And that's actually, uh, hopefully that would be true, right? You don't want your connection to constantly be changing. But what you see is also that uh, after the administration of psilocybin in this mouse, you can also see some addition of some new dendritic spines suggesting the growth of some new neuronal connections. So we've got these little blobs, these spines that represent connections to another neuron. Some of them are coming in, new spines, new synapses potentially are forming after psilocybin. We also have some leaving. What's the net effect of psilocybin in the mouse brain? Is it to create more connections or fewer connections? Yeah, so the net effect that we see is that psilocybin uh, promote the formation of new spines. So we have quantified these and look at uh, how the numbers changes, and um, that's known as the formation rate and the elimination rate. So we call that a spine is forming if you can see one that uh, where there previously was no spine, and then now you look at the next day and you start to see a spine, that's a spine that's formed. 
Uh, by contrast, if you have an existing spine and then you see that spine got removed, then that's the elimination rate. And what we have seen in our study is that psilocybin increases the amount of spine formation rate. So we just see more spines forming, whereas the elimination rate does not really change, leading to a net effect of uh, more dendritic spines, or again, uh, reflecting more neuronal connection in the mouse's head 